someday we will uh, be able to do it uh, on per in person. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yes. So uh, let me see if I can uh, share my. I think you, okay. you can. Do you see my my slides? Yes. Okay. So today I was asked to talk about um, <clears throat> agroecosystem management at the landscape level. And uh, <clears throat> first of all, I wanted to summarize some points that I already I think I already talked to you about, which is uh, <clears throat> that agriculture it implies the simplification of natural ecosystems. So if we have a natural forest, we transform it into a monoculture of rice. That um, process uh, actually uh, involves the decrease in biodiversity. And because these systems, usually monocultures lack biodiversity, we need to have inputs from the outside. We need to manage the systems intensively in order to replace the natural processes that occur in the uh, in the natural ecosystem, so in the in the in the tropic in the forest, for example, we don't need to apply pesticides or fertilizers or anything like that, because there are so many biodiversity components that are interacting, and through their interactions, they sponsor the soil fertility, the pest regulation, the productivity of the system. But as we get rid of that biodiversity by transforming the systems into monocultures, then we need to use external inputs. So in agroecology, what we're looking for are intermediate systems, systems like agroforestry systems, polycultures that have high levels of biodiversity and that they require some management, some inputs, but not as much as a monoculture. Actually, in agroecology, we talk about establishing an agriculture of processes rather than an agriculture of inputs. So in, in intensive agriculture, you use inputs. Here, what we do is we try to emphasize ecological processes in this uh, new design systems by having systems that have high levels of biodiversity. So what happens is that when we have a natural ecosystem and we alter it, we modify it, we simplify it with modern practices like pesticides and fertilizers and monoculture, we, get, we start eroding the, um, the strengths, the inherent strengths that characterize an, an ecosystem. For example, interdependency, self-regulation, self-renewal, self-sufficiency, efficiency, diversity. These are all characteristics of natural ecosystems, but we erode them as we apply modern practices and, and uh, monoculture simplification landscape practices. So what we try to do in agroecology is to try to bring back some of these, these features, some of these inherent strengths back to the agricultural systems. So we wanna bring back diversity, efficiency, self-sufficiency, self-renewal, self-regulation and interdependency between the different components. So for example, this is a, a valley in the north part of Chile. That's where I was born in a country in Latin America. And uh, this valley was characterized by traditional polycultures of fruit trees. And here, these systems basically provided much of the, um, <clears throat> the goods that the local people ha needed, but also many ecosystem services, preservation of biodiversity, purification of water, et cetera, et cetera. But the systems were transformed into monocultures of, of grapes. And by doing that, you lose all the, the, the ecological benefits that were associated with the original biodiversity of the systems. Um, for example, in Italy also, if you go to the region of Toscana, Umbria, you will find some areas where, that are still characterized by high levels of agrobiodiversity at the landscape level. For example, you have systems where you have uh, grapes and, uh, and olive trees intercropped, surrounded by some natural vegetation. But these systems are also disappearing because there is a, high pr a lot of pressure for land to produce grapes in monocultures like this. So as we transition from this biodiverse traditional systems to monocultures, we lose many elements of biodiversity, resiliency, and so on. 
The same thing is happening with coffee here in, in for example, in Colombia, where I'm based right now. Uh, in Colombia, they, they grow the coffee in multi-strata agroforestry systems, but because of pressures from the market and agricultural policies, uh, there is a tendency to reduce biodiversity in the systems um, to systems that only have many one shade tree species or no shade at all. And uh, by doing that, you reduce the biodiversity of the systems, you reduce the ecological services. So for example, here you can see a coffee, a traditional agroforestry system of coffee transformed into a monoculture. These monoculture varieties may be more productive, but they require much more inputs. They require fertilizer and uh, watering and fungicides, where in these systems, maybe you get lower yields, a little bit lower yields, like half the yields, but you don't need to use inputs. And in, and in addition to that, you get all the benefits of, of the forest that is associated with this coffee system. And there's uh, interesting research showing that as we simplify the systems, also they lose the resiliency to um, withstand uh, extreme climatic effects. So for example, you can see here, this is the evapotranspiration of a system of, of um, polyculture, agroforestry coffee system, as opposed to a monoculture. And you can see that the, uh, the, the main loss of water is what is evaporation, which is non-productive water that is being lost from the soil because transpiration is actually productive water because uh, through transpiration is the way, you know, plants absorb many of the nutrients they need. So you can see that we need to, that by having shade, you reduce the evaporation and you conserve water during, during times of uh, drought which although this is a tropical country, there's, there's a lot of periods of long droughts now with climate change. And we also have seen um, that the systems, when you simplify them, they start suffering from the effects of hurricanes that are becoming very, very common in Central America and the Caribbean, for example. So you see here, this is an area that was surveyed in, um, in Honduras, a Central American country, uh, with agroforestry systems, soil conservation practices. Uh, and this is right after the Hurricane Mitch that happened back in the, uh, in the 90s. And you can see that there was almost no damage in the system. Uh, not too far from here, because I, I was visiting the area, not, not far from here, we go, you take this road this way, uh, you find these farms that were monoculture farms, and you can see the huge mudslides that happened due to the uh, saturation of the soil with the heavy um, rainfall and, the, and there were many, 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 uh, a lot of damage in these monoculture farms. So actually a, a colleague of mine called Eddie Hall Jimenez did some research and he found in Honduras particularly that the, mono, the agroecological farms, the diversified farms suffer much less from hurricanes than the monoculture farms. And the same thing has happened in Cuba. Uh, there's some research that has been done after, for example, Hurricane Ike. Uh, these are the monocultures that were totally wiped out by the hurricane, whereas the, the more diversified agroforestry systems with complex hedgerows and, and windbreaks and so on didn't suffer as much as the monoculture systems. So what we're seeing is that um, after um, that the agroecosystem resiliency is very much um, associated with the um, vegetational diversity of the system. The landscape matrix, the nature of the matrix that surround the farm is very important. If you're surrounded by forests, for example, you will suffer less from hurricanes than you are if you're surrounded by uh, empty fields or monoculture fields. And also, of course, all the soil and water management practices that are used, soil cover, water harvesting, organic matter content, are very, very important, especially for drought resiliency. So what is happening is that um, we have created systems that are not very resilient, not very sustainable. Um, about 80% of the 1.5 million hectares of global arable land are grown under monocultures. Um, that's uh, it's a huge amount of land Agriculture, industrial agriculture is becoming a major force that is modifying the biosphere. And um, these systems are not 
are not resilient, are very vulnerable actually. They may have temporary economic advantages for farmers, but in the long term, they do not represent an ecological optimum. And really this drastic narrowing of the uh, cultivated plant diversity is putting the world's food production in greater peril. So um, there's a lot of research that has shown that by homogenizing the landscape, by making the systems genetically uniform, most major crops become impressively vulnerable to epidemics and climate variability. <clears throat> so, and in addition to that, these monocultures produce degradation, deforestation, soil erosion, soil degradation, etc. And what are the factors that are the pin uh, and natural ecosystem degradation? Uh, farm size increase. There is a tremendous increase in, far, in, in farm size in many countries. There is a reduction of hedgerows and surrounding biodiversity, uh, expansion of monocultures, consolidation of farms in fewer hands, mechanization induced simplification and homogenization, massive application of pesticides. These are all factors that contribute to ecosystem degradation. And, and I know, I don't know in Indonesia, but I know in Malaysia, there is a tremendous um, impact of, um, um, of the African palm oil plantations at the expense of natural ecosystems. So there are many, many degrading agricultural activities that, that degrade the landscapes, the agro landscapes. Uh, deforestation is one, degraded pastures, erosive farming, overgrazing. These are all forces that are at play. But also there are other um, forces like in Latin America, mining, for example, is coming to the, to the, to the rural areas and also um, plantations of pines and eucalyptus and so on which is also contributing to ecosystem degradation. Now, what are the consequences of well, homogenizing the landscapes then? Um, first, the first is increased vulnerability to pests and diseases. This has been well demonstrated. Um, also instability in yield, pro in, in yield and in productivity to, due to weather changes in, in weather change patterns due to climate change. And also, locus, obviously, loss of ecosystem services, such biological control, uh, pollination, and other uh, processes that are important. And the other thing is that we, we know is that uh, the systems become very, very susceptible to climate change. Uh, here is uh, the, uh, the average global temperature. Uh, we hope that it's not going to go above 1.5 degrees centigrade. That's what most of the, uh, the Paris Agreement and so on are, are shooting at, but actually we're already past that and we're probably around two degrees now because we have more than 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And you can see that the increase in temperature, this is the global average temperature, as, as it goes up, the, the yields of most crops go down, uh, especially under monoculture situations. For example, in um, 2012, we had the worst drought in, in, in the Midwest of the United States. Um, and then uh, about 30% of uh, soybean and corn, mostly transgenic actually, um, the lost productivity in about 30%. In California, we have had uh, concurrent droughts. Now we're entering into a new one. But in 2014, the drought actually, um, had to, farmers had to abandon farming 400,000 acres because of lack of water. And uh, that led to a huge loss of about $1.5 billion. And also we know that when we <clears throat> increase monocultures and genetic homogeneity, um, there's also susceptibility to diseases. And in 1970, the, in, in the United States, there was a huge loss in corn production due to the, uh, uh, a, a leaf um, a, a fungi that affected the foliage resulted in, in, a, in a decrease of the maize crop from one, 119 million tons to uh, one, 105. The yield went down uh, to from, from uh, about 53 to 55 kilos, 50,000 kilos to about 45,000 kilos. 
And because of that susceptibility and vulnerability, we have to spray pesticides. And you can see here, Asia is the uh, green, as you can see there, the green curve. This is the pesticide sales that are going up. Uh, in Latin America, the same thing, even in Europe is going up. So, um, and this is, um, we're using about 2.3 billion kilos of active ingredients of herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides that are injected into the biosphere with huge ecological impacts. In the United States, it's estimated that the ecological impacts and health impacts of pesticides is around $10 billion a year. And then obviously crops lose, uh, I mean, nature always responds in a way and, and uh, here you have the resistance. There's about 500 species of insects that are resistant to more than 1000 different types of insecticides, but also there are plant pathogens and as well as weeds that are becoming increasingly resistant to, to herbicides and fungicides. And despite the fact that we, um, there's so many warnings about uh, monoculture expansion, um, the, the area of um, transgenic crops is increasing and the area of crops under for biofuels is also increasing. Right now, there's more than 240 million hectares under monocultures of, uh, of transgenic crops. For example, in 2017, this hasn't changed much, but the US, Brazil, and Argentina are leading in, uh, in the production of um, soybean and corn that is transgenic. And what, what transgenic soybean does uh, in, in large agro landscapes is condemn farmers to monoculture and glyphosate. Because uh, you see the advantage for farmers is that they don't have to worry too much about weed control because they have a herbicide resistant soybean. They spray glyphosate indiscriminately and uh, there's no effect on the crop, but you cannot diversify here. You cannot, you cannot intercrop or practice rotations because, of, because glyphosate will kill everything except the soybean that is genetically engineered. And we know that glyphosate uh, has been also already considered probably cancerogenic by the World Health Organization. It is well known that it's a powerful endocrine disruptor, decreases fertility in men, affects digestive system of bees, has negative effects on soil microbiology. And Monsanto, well now Bayer, uh, has been sentenced to pay millions of dollars to farmers with cancer linked to glyphosate use. And in Brazil and Argentina, uh, and also in the United States, there is already development of weeds that are resistant to glyphosate. So all the brown here is soybean, the rest are green is weeds that are resistant to glyphosate. There's more than 12 species in South America that are resistant to glyphosate already. And then in, in the case of BT crops, um, BT corn, BT cotton, for example, in the case of cotton in, 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 in Mexico and also in Brazil, um, <clears throat> you can see there's a complex of different insect species that are associated with, uh, with, uh, with uh, cotton. The only ones that are susceptible to, um, to the BT, the Bacillus thuringiensis uh, toxin that has been genetically engineered into the, into the plant are the Lepidoptera insects. So you have the army worms, the cabbage loopers, the ball worm, et cetera. But there are others, there are weevils, there are aphids, there are white flies, there are thrips, there are ligus bugs that are not susceptible. They're not affected by, by, the, um, <clears throat> by the, um, the, the BT crop. And so you can see here, this is the survivor, percent surviving of plant of insects on the, uh, on the BT cotton. And you can see that all the Lepidoptera are basically uh, susceptible. But this other, the Ligos, this is also a Lepidoptera, which is the fallen army worm, Spodoptera frugiperda, is not affected by it. And they're the, you know, the, the, the bald weevil and the aphids and so on. So if you have this pest, then the crop will be affected. But if you have this pest, then you're losing your time. And this is why actually um, <clears throat> pesticide use is going up, insecticide use is going up in BT crops because also these insects that become um, susceptible, 
They also acquire resistance to the BT if the BT is continuously used. So in summary, <laughs> we have become dependent on food producing ecosystems that are not sustainable. They are not sustainable because we lose soil faster than soil is formed. We lose by organic matter continuously. We lose nutrients. We also leach chemicals into the environment, into the water bodies. We're creating um, dead zones in the, in the oceans and so on. Uh, our agriculture is susceptible to weeds, to ins insect pests, to diseases that we have to spray. With <clears throat> our agricultural systems threaten pollinators soil biota, other wildlife. There's a recent paper talking about the effect of pesticides on, on, micro, on soil, my, on soil um, fauna. It is vulnerable to climate change. It relies on fossil fuels. It relies on agrochemical inputs and also on sophisticated genetics to sustain production. So really this is, when you look at this, it's like, how is it that we design this agriculture that is so unsustainable? because of all these reasons. And on top of that, <clears throat> it has externalities that um, are not accounted for in the economic analysis. If farmers or the companies that produce the chemicals had to pay for the externalities, for example, water contamination, biodiversity loss, impacts on human health, soil losses, air emissions of greenhouse gases that also are produced by, by, by the um, industrial agriculture, Actually, they will not be in business. <clears throat> in the United States, the only reason farmers survive, the large farmers, is because they are subsidized by the government. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> in addition to that, our agriculture, the way we practice, uh, is one of the main sources of pathogens that emerge in the ecotones of industrialism. The entire production line is organized around practices that accelerate the evolution of pathogen virulence and sub subsequent uh, transmission. So for example, there's a long list of deadly pathogens that arose due to the way we practice animal production and the large scale. Avian flu, uh, avian influenza, swine flu, and a variety of other types of flus have all been associated with, it, with the way we, we raise the animals. Uh, in, in operations where you have confined animals, genetically homogeneous or similar animals. And all this uh, leave the animals more susceptible to viral infections, but also create conditions whereby new pathogens can evolve into more infectious types. And there's big uh, arguments that perhaps COVID-19 was associated with this or more than that, due to the, um, to the uh, advance of monocultures at the expense of natural forest. For example, <clears throat> industrial agriculture is causing huge deforestation at, at, at the global level. The expansion of industrial agriculture was the engine of 60% of all the forest area lost on the planet, equivalent to 46.1 million hectares per year, okay? And uh, between 2000 and 2012, the average was 7.2 million hectares of tropical forest destroyed each year in the world, 52% in the period between 2013 and 2019, equivalent to 10.9 million hectares. And guess what? The leading countries, Brazil, Indonesia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo account for 51% of the world's deforestation. And as we advance with deforestation, we destroy habitats where you have wildlife that is present here, you know, birds and bats and armadillos and all kinds of wildlife that coexist with many, many viruses. And, uh, but they are contained within these habitats. But when, this is, with the, when we destroy the forest, then there's spillover. There's, uh, this is the reason why we have the zoonotic diseases. And <clears throat> it is estimated that we have about 1.7 million undiscovered viruses that exist in mammalian and, and, and avian hosts. And of this, about 600, 600 to 800,000 
could have the ability to infect humans. So really preventing future pandemic nature and economic model that, that, that is very extractive that, that we're following throughout the world. <clears throat> so now that I give you uh, that kind of um, grim <laughs> situation, uh, let's talk a little bit about hope, okay? How, how can we meet a growing demand for our cultural products while conserving biodiversity in a changing climate? So the goal is um, uh, to develop sustainable, resilient landscapes where the achievements of conservation and agricultural produce, production are mutually reinforcing. Most of the people that work in conservation of nature see agriculture as an enemy and, and we need to correct that because it is possible to produce while conserving nature. So the goals of conservation are very similar to the goals of agriculture. On the one side, you see, we wanna preserve biodiversity. We, work, we wanna keep, eco keep ecological um, communities and ecosystem functions and services. We wanna maintain connectivity of the landscape. We want to increase the resiliency of the landscape. Well, in agriculture, we want to satisfy human and food and fiber needs. We want to sustain yields. We want to diversify production. We want to minimize dependence on external inputs. And we want to reduce the vulnerability to, to climate change. So <clears throat> therefore, there is a, a marriage that is being proposed between the disciplines of agroecology and ecological restoration. On the one side, produce healthy and accessible food in harmony with the surrounding environment. And then with ecological restoration, recover the capacity of ecosystems to provide ecological services and goods to agriculture. So we have nature providing services to agriculture and agriculture uh, living in harmony with, with, with natural ecosystems. So for that, we need to not only work at the farm level, which is what we usually do as researchers, you know, we, we work in a farm or in a, in a field that we wanna diversify it, but we ignore the, the, the matrix that surrounds. This matrix is the matrix of industrial agriculture. There's no biodiversity, there's no surrounding vegetation. We wanna move this into a matrix like, like the one below, where we have agriculture growing agricultural plots interspersed in, within forest patches and corridors. So there is landscape connectivity and these systems are much more productive, more resilient, more sustainable than these ones that you see above. So the approach has to be at the landscape level. And when we have a farm like this that is surrounded by natural vegetation, there are uh, better conditions for agriculture not only microclimatic conditions improve, but these this patches of vegetation provide habitat for many beneficial insects and other organisms. They also provide biomass, they conserve water, et cetera, et cetera. They have many, many services. So you, you can see here that the farm will benefit the natural vegetation and the natural vegetation will benefit the farm. How, how does that happen? For example, the farm benefits the, the natural ecosystem. By not using pesticides, farms benefit biodiversity in the matrix. By conserving water and soil, farmers avoid con contamination and sedimentation of rivers that are surrounding the farms. Small diversified farms provide connectivity to the landscape. Now, how does the uh, natural vegetation uh, help agriculture. Well, it provides habitat for beneficial insects, protects waterways, modifies the microclimate and protects against winds, and the matrix provides biomass, organic matter, and also edible plants, because many farmers actually uh, will harvest from, from there. And I'm sure you...
rice flowers or simple habitats, um, they have much more natural enemies, much more natural enemies than the fields that are surrounded by simple habitats. And then what, what does that, this, I'm sorry, this is in Spanish, that the diversification of the landscape increases the abundance of predators, the abundance of predators reduces the abundance of pests, and this uh, minimizes the use of pesticides and increases the yields of the crop. So the idea, the ideal um, <clears throat> design in, ag in agroecology is a, is a design where you have farms that are surrounded by complex landscape matrix. And um, this is an example, for example, in Mexico, the small farmers usually plant corn and beans with alfalfa in a rotation. And they also, they, they, they plant some trees among the, the wild trees, they plant fruit trees and other, and other plants that uh, provide services for the farmers. So for example, here, you can see that the, the crop, you know, just if we consider just the planted area, uh, there were 11 crops as well as um, non-crop plants that provided food for, for the family. But the border, this border had a rich um, composition of fruit trees, about eight different species that provided about 0.64 tons of food for the family. And, and actually it um, provided one third of the income that the family received. So what is agroecological restoration? Is the process of reestablishing ecological relationships between farms and the surrounding environment in order to produce food, but at the same time provide ecological services. So basically what we wanna do is, is to kind of design farms, but having in mind that the complex matrix that surrounds it is important. So again, this is in Spanish, but here we have the agroecological restoration, agroecology, landscape ecology. Landscape ecology provides bi landscape biodiversity. Agroecology provides agricultural biodiversity, and both of them are important in establishing the resiliency of the farm. So with agroecology, we can restore the biodiversity in the farming systems but also we can conserve the biodiversity and the natural resources at the landscape level with hedgerows, corridors, terraces, vegetated ditches, riparian buffers, corridors, etc. All, both of them, both strategies at the farm level and at the landscape level contribute to increase biodiversity of, of um, special organisms like natural enemies, pollinators, decomposers, beneficial biota. This species then provide ecosystem functions like pollination, biological control, nutrient cycling, etc. And those ecosystem functions then translate into ecosystem services, plant health, soil fertility, water conservation, productivity. So for example, let's consider this landscape and each number that you you can see here is, is some kind of a practice that you can use at the landscape level. So for example, one is um, dispersed trees that are in the landscape. Um, five would be hedgerows that you provide within the, the, in, in the landscape uh, and so on and so on. So there are many, many efforts that are going on in Latin America about um, restoration of the landscapes before you start farming. So for example, here in, uh, in Colombia, you can see that Colombia has three mountain chains. And in this area here, there is a micro watershed of a community that didn't have any, any water at the beginning. And the reason is that um, the watershed was totally deforested. So the community got organized and started setting up a restoration ecology project to the point that they restored, they reforested the whole watershed. And now there's enough water for 75 families, for food production, for the animals that they have and so on. 
So, but now they also have to modify their agricultural systems because they used to grow arracacha, which is like a, a tuber crop, like a potato in monoculture, um, very degrading, very heavy pesticide use. And um, so now that they have water, they wanted to diversify the farming systems. So they started transforming the system by planting hedgerows of uh, Pitonia diversifolia, which is a composite plant that grows very, very, very tall. I don't know if you have it in, in Indonesia, it's, it looks like a sunflower. And it it's a very, very rich source of, um, of um, phosphorus in the foliage. So they use it as a green manure, but also the flower attracts beneficial insects, also fodder for animals. And, um, and then you can see here that they're already establishing the corridors and the hedgerows of Titonia. They're also reducing Ricinus communis, which is, um, I don't know how you call it, castor bean, which is a plant that, um, that grows very fast as a provisional shade in order to establish coffee and other plants. And then at the end, the, the system is advancing, as you can see here. Um, and then ends up to be like this, uh, an agroforestry system with more than 25 different species, with corridors of plants that are auxiliary that provide many other benefits. And this farm now uh, doesn't require much external inputs. And actually the water requirements have also declined because so much shade provides micro, microclimate conditions and also soil cover, which um, reduces the evaporation. In other areas, for example, in Mexico, um, farmers um, are in, in, in many areas um, in the highlands of Oaxaca, for example, a state of Mexico, um, total deforestation, total degradation of the soil. But what is the future of these communities? If they go, they leave, they go to the United States, they don't let them in, you know? So they started uh, staying and in order to stay, they started, um, a total reconstruction of uh, uh, a restoration of the landscape. So they started, first of all, reforesting the top of the, ma the, of the hills with uh, Pinus oaxacensis, which is a local pine species. Then they started creating terraces and systems. And then uh, in order to have, because it rains there, but maybe two months a month, two months a year, uh, about 1,000 millimeters, but the rest of the year doesn't rain, so they need to harvest water, which allows then the uh, allows for farmers to to be able to uh, to to grow their crops. So this group called Sedicam, in a period of five years, uh, uh, um, planted more than one million trees. They set up soil conservation and water harvesting practices that allow the the recuperation of uh, food production. And more than 1,000 farmers trained on agroecology on more than 500 hectares already restored by, the, by them. Uh, this is an agro landscape in the south central part of Chile that also was subject to heavy erosion because was, this area was totally devoted to wheat production in monoculture. But after year after year after year of wheat, you can see the results. So there's a group there, it's an NGO that uh, set up a um, a training center with the goal of restoring this, this piece of land in a kind of a semi-arid area of, uh, of Chile. And they started like this, this is 1990, this is 2000, this is 2007, 2016. And you can see that there has been a total restoration of, of, that, of that hillside. And they have measured the soil losses they went down because they started doing practices like terracing and planting and contour. Um, the crop production started going up. Um, and then, although this is in Spanish, they build a, 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 this radar with different indicators, organic matter, for example, um, the soil, soil cover, the reduction of erosion, the diversity, etc. And you can see this is when they started the green and this is where they are today. In, in 2013. Actually, they are much more advanced now. So you can see that you can measure the progress of the, of the restoration with these indicators. 
And this is another farmer in, uh, in Cuba that uh, his, he and his family received a piece of land. At the beginning, they were conventional farmers. See this reference point here? At the beginning, they were growing just corn and uh, tobacco. And they transformed this farm into this, um, this uh, network of plots surrounded by hedgerows and, and windbreaks that provide many, many services to the farm. There's a lot of, uh, inside of in, in the plots, there's rotations, agroforestry systems, and so on. And these farmers uh, show that you can decrease the use of external inputs to almost zero in a, in, a, in a 20 year period by just designing a farm that is biodiverse, that little by little through the interactions, they, don't, they start uh, minimizing the need for external inputs. And then uh, there are many examples also about um, with tropical pastures in Colombia, transforming these monocultures of grasses that are very susceptible to drought into silvopastoral systems. So the idea is that you have this system where you have grasses, you have shrubs of lucina and other species, some trees, uh, some of them are lucina, but some other, uh, are other tree species that provide shade the animal condition improves tremendously and, um, and you can increase actually the production of water, the, of milk from 1.7 liters to about five and uh, the, the, the current capacity from one animal to four animals per hectare. <clears throat> the temperature, as you can see, decreases two or three degrees in, in here. The relative humidity goes up and the evapotranspiration goes down tremendously. So these systems are much more resilient to climate change. So you can see here the production of milk stays around 10 liters per cow per, 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 per day. And you can see here that this is the, um, the precipitation regime. And regardless of the precipitation variability, uh, the, the yield of milk production stays the same. So it is interesting here in Colombia, there's a group called CIPAD, uh, which uh, promotes the silvopastoral systems. And there are many, many examples of farms that have uh, done a huge transformation from 2003, for example, here to 2007, just by adopting silvopastoral system, you can see the change in the landscape. Um, this is the, uh, this is the, 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 the initial vegetational cover of the farm. And now th this is the vegetation cover in 2016. And uh, you can see that the system now has uh, mostly pastures, but with a, with a forest cover. Um, all that you see here, you think this is a forest, but actually it's a silvopastoral system. There are cows here that are grazing, okay? Um, this is another farm um, that you can see that um, it has a natural vegetation here and there was a restoration of all this area. And um, so here you can see they started with um, planting um, what they called um, corridors of fodder and for animals, but also for the food security of the family corn and beans and things like that. And you can see here the design of the farm in the restored area. All these corridors are producing forage, um, forage plants, but also they are producing food for the family. Okay, so you have seven hectares of restoration, 3.5 hectares of agriculture. So really then when we start moving from this monoculture areas, degraded areas to an area of high uh, biodiversity, low intensification, you can see that uh, all these ecological services uh, or ecosystem services increase, the supporting services, the provisioning services, the regulating services, the cultural services start increasing as you change from this matrix to this matrix. So the idea is transforming, restoring. This is in Brazil, 
a very famous um, photographer um, has this farm and he converted into this in just a period of about 10 years. The same thing with coffee systems. You, you, you can have the systems like this and you can restore them to something like this by having um, not only diversification within the farm, but also working in creating a complex landscape matrix that surrounds the farm. This is in England, a farmer um, that works with his farm, uh, taking a kind of holistic systemic approach of design. So it is surrounded by natural vegetation. He has planted some hedgerows purposely that are going to increase the, the, the landscape diversity because he doesn't have control over the area that surrounds his farm, but he can actually create uh, boundaries, biological boundaries in his farm. So within the farm, he will have, for example, beetle banks, um, basically vegetated strips that provide habitat for, for beetles, uh, ground beetles that control pests, uh, especially in cereals. Um, he also doesn't cut all the alfalfa, but he leaves strips of alfalfa because that when he cuts the, he told me when, when I cut the, everything, all the insects are gone. So what he discovered is that if he cut, but left some strips of uncut alfalfa, this alfalfa would provide habitat to maintain insects that are, that are important for his farm uh, and preserve them. And then also he, he enriches the hedgerows with different plants that are gonna have multiple purposes. Some that attracts pollinators, some that are providing wood or medicine or forage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that he's improving, he's increasing um, his diversity uh, and also planting plants, for example, in this case, stinging nettle, which is an important um, in, in plant that attracts beneficial insects because it has a flowering period. And then just the last example, I wanted to give you that this can happen at very large scale. This is, a, this is an abandoned soybean farm, transgenic soybean farm in Argentina. You can see the erosion and the, and the, the destruction of the waterways and the contamination of waterways and, and so on. Well, this farm was bought by, a, by an American who restored it to a, to a large scale, 3000 hectare farm with a contour planting and also the recovery of this, um, this, this arms of uh, biodiversity. He enriched this biodiversity and, um, and preserved it so that it, so that it penetrates into the fields and contributes with, um, with animal biodiversity. So you can see here the farm with, uh, with this, um, this arms of biodiversity, these corridors. And uh, in here, he planted a cover crop, uh, a legume to recover the soil. And here uh, he will plant um, some pasture and fruit trees. So basically in this area, in this green area, when the, um, when the cover crops are done after two or three years, he will plant, he planted uh, what is called strip intercropping systems. And then in this area that, that you see here that is brown, he planted a corridor of fruit trees with pastures that are going to have sheep that are going to be grazing here with um, electric fencing. So you can see that this farm, so here you have the, the cover crop, uh, here is gonna be the in strip intercropping, and here's gonna, here are the, the fruit trees and the pasture for the, uh, for the animals that are gonna be grazing, do practicing rotational grazing. And that's another shot of a farm, as you can see, that is possible to have production conservation at the same time, but you have to design the farm in a way that whatever you do in agriculture is going to enhance the ecological services of the, of the surrounding matrix. And whatever you do in the surrounding matrix has to benefit agriculture also. So that's basically the, 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 the idea, the approach that, that we take 
um, in order to transform these monocultures. This is, for example, sugarcane here in Colombia. There's a farm near in, in, in the midst of the sugarcane growing area that has uh, forest and uh, also corridors of different plants penetrating into the uh, into the uh, into the sugar fields and, and, and enhancing their biodiversity. So with that, uh, I wanted to maybe open the floor for questions or discussion. So Uma, you will um, coordinate that or, or how does it happen? Uma, suaranya belum terdengar. Buma, suaranya, suaranya Bu, Buma. Halo, halo. Ya, good, halo. yes. Uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, sometimes it happen. And uh, thank you, Prof. Altieri. So, and before we open the question, I would like to highlight uh, uh, some, uh, yeah, from uh, uh, Prof. Altieri talk about uh, when we move from biodiverse farms to monoculture, we will lose agriculture at the island because we lose uh, uh, because we lost ec ecosystem services resulting in, for example, more inputs to be imported to the system. And then it also can reduce uh, the resilience to climate, uh, for example, with uh, increasing of evapo evapotranspiration because uh, we lost shade and then uh, we also lost uh, protection uh, to our uh, uh, nature. For example, if there is uh, like a hurricane, then uh, without uh, this uh, biodiversification, we can suffer more. Uh, so yeah, so that's the highlight from the talk. And if uh, there are some questions, please. I see, I see a question in the chat that says that oh. the local oh. government is, is the government, local government involved in the designing the landscape or it was done privately by the farmers. Uh, ah. In most cases, in most cases that I showed the government was not involved. There were initiatives of the farmers mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. However, there are certain local governments that provide some incentive for farmers for conservation. And uh, so if farmers plant certain trees or they can finance the soil conservation practices or some, some trees that are planted. But most of the examples that I show came from either individual farmers that, are, that have the resources or small farmers that got organized collectively to carry mm -hmm. out the restoration. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that, uh, uh, Prof. Altieri. In many many cases, uh, it seems like that that uh, we are from a grassroots who develop this without the help from government, and it's also the case in Indonesian in Indonesia mostly. But I saw many cases like in Europe, uh, there are a lot of involvement of government to develop this uh, uh, landscape and etc. Are there more questions? Oh, okay. Uh, actually, I still can I have while waiting others. Uh, yes. 
Okay, uh, it's it's really interesting. Uh, especially, I, I really love your uh, pictures with the redesign. Uh, 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 with the redesign of farms. So, yeah, um, it's, it's a bit like, uh, um, because I'm also teaching on organic agriculture and I also uh, introduce some uh, uh, method like permaculture. And then maybe some students also uh, still confused about the difference between agroecology and permaculture. Uh, do you have some uh, yeah. explanation? Well, yeah, there are many, many terms out there right now. You know, there's permaculture, biodynamic farming, organic farming, regenerative farming, sustainable intensification, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Many, many, many. And um, in the case, for example, of permaculture, permaculture was originated in in Australia. And they have uh, Bill Mollison was kind of the the, the, the person that, that came up with the idea, and uh, and there are now some other dis disciples that follow, and they have their own principles. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> agriculture is a science that studies all the, the agricultural systems, and there are some general principles that govern how farms should be designed to be resilient and, and biodiverse and productive. It's just like ecology. Ecology is a science that studies all kinds of ecosystems in the world. The tundra, the, the tropical rainforest, the desert, and all of them are, are governed by the same principles. It's just that the structure and the function of the ecosystem is different. Obviously, a tropical rainforest is much more diverse than the tundra ecosystem, but, they are, but the principles are the same. So the same thing with agroecology. Agroecology is a science, and there are some people that practice permaculture following the principles of Mollison, and this is fine. But you can go to a, one of those farms and assess it and see that they're not applying all the agroecological principles, and you could actually optimize that farm. Mm -hmm. The same thing with organic farms or biodynamic farms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really, Agroecology is not interested in saying that permaculture is, is, is not right or the principles are wrong. No, it's that, you know, there are people that practice permaculture, that practice organic farming, that practice uh, biodynamic farming and so on. And they follow the principles of their, of their um, originators. But that doesn't mean that those farms are agroecologically based. Mm -hmm. So you can go to a, an organic farm and, and see that it's a monoculture that is functioning with input substitution. Well, there's a lot that you can do to improve that farm with agroecological principles. Same thing with uh, biodynamic farms, the same thing with permaculture farms. So that's basically my take on the, on the, on the, mm -hmm. on the situation. I, mm -hmm. It's not something to confront, you know, permaculture is not good. No, no, no. They, I've seen permaculture farms that are, that are great, they're working, they follow the principles of Mollison and everything, but they could be improved if, they, if you apply the agroecological principles. You could optimize them even more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And what I see from these two terms are uh, about the zoning, yeah? And because uh, in permaculture, they have some zones and then uh, in agroecosystem, they try to fine-tuning some elements uh, into the, uh, the system. So both of them try to, to make the all element functions uh, uh, well. So... Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in permaculture, but permaculture is also much wider because also it includes the, the design of the house, the design mm -hmm. of the energy and the water mm -hmm. and everything. So it's, it's a much more... Um, complete approach to mm -hmm. the planning of a farm. Mm -hmm. Agroecology doesn't get too much mm -hmm. involved in that. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are things to learn from each other. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And I do not agree that this permaculture comes from Australia. It comes from Indonesia. Oh, okay. It, it's from Pekarangan. And then Bill Mollison write it and uh, uh, write the book. And so that it seems come from Australia, but actually, <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think this is from Indonesia. <laughs> yeah. Good. Good. I didn't know that. Well, actually, when I was in Bandung University mm -hmm. back in then in the eighties, I saw so many systems that could be called permaculture. Yeah. You know, a lot of uh, a, a lot of agroforestry systems, a lot of home gardens. Incredible, incredible diversity. Uh. Still have some uh, questions. Luma, bisa yeah, Sanggo, uh, please, uh, Pak Lukman. Okay, thank you, Prof. Altieri. It is very uh, interesting and outstanding lecture. Thank you for your uh, knowledge and also the experience. So actually. Uh, we uh, in uh, our uh, faculty, so we also uh, already uh, implement this kind of uh, agriculture management. And some, uh, so we actually we based on the IPM program. Yeah, IPM program is an extension program that uh, we make a concept that the uh, Actually, same like uh, agriculture uh, management, and also uh, our government also has this kind of uh, uh, program extension that uh, already implemented. Uh, for example, in uh, Lamongan district, so they already implement more than a hundred uh, hectare in uh, rice fields. So, uh, actually, uh, the principle is same, and and we also uh, in this this uh, lecture uh, management of so we we use uh, the concept of uh, your concept. <laughs> so we we teach uh, the uh, student all. I think uh, most of the uh, source is. Uh, using your your concept and uh, i mean the agriculture management so um so they they use uh, for example uh, soil organic management and then uh, using a uh, hetero a refugia and how to incorporate the biomass uh, recycle to the uh, to the land and yeah. but uh, they uh, found uh, a problem here, uh, Prof. Adir. So when they use the refugia, for example, so they plant the refugia mm -hmm. for hedge. Sometimes uh, they, they either, this is uh, right or not, yeah. they, they, they found that uh, the red, the rodent, rodent pest, uh, uh, what you, increase uh, the, the problem. That's what they only uh, plan not so so dense, but just uh, yes, uh, some the interval or something like that. Uh, but I don't know. This is this uh, of uh, this data is uh, correct or not? But if you have any experience yeah, about this, so uh, uh, what what how to cope uh, the uh, pest, uh, whatever, red, uh, pest yeah, in uh, in rice based system and also uh, actually this uh, uh, this is uh, uh, what you extra program is handled by uh, collaboration also the, with uh, our department sometimes we provide the what you call it uh, biocontrol and something like that so this is this this one problem some uh, sometime they, they said to us uh, probably you have any experience about that uh, thank you thank you yeah um, <clears throat> there are many many situations that when people start increasing the biodiversity of their farms with hedgerows or within the farm uh, sometimes uh, there might be some 
issues that arise that we didn't know. <laughs> you know, we, we, we're we learning. So for example, the fact that you have rodents present in the hedgerows means that perhaps uh, you are providing habitat for them. And so you need to either um, change the planting pattern so that there's not very dense, so that they don't find ways to hide or whatever. Or uh, as I have seen in other places, what they do is they, they plant, they, they, they put this purchase for bird for the raptors mm -hmm. in, the, in the field, inside the field, they put this purchase that will attract raptors, birds that eat the, 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 the mice. So that, that's another practice that is, that is used. Mm -hmm. So what I'm, this is a learning process. I mean, it's not automatic that if you set up the diversity that you want, uh, benefits will, will, will arise immediately. Sometimes there are problems. Sometimes, for example, in California, the, some hedgerow plants serve as a host for an insect that, that brings a, a bacteria to the, to the vineyards mm -hmm. it's a, as a vector. So you don't want to plant those plants, but how do you know that that plant was going to do that? You didn't know. So you need, yeah. you know, we need to learn. This is why the monitoring mm -hmm. has to be very, very important in order to, to mm -hmm. monitor and see what's happening. Because as soon as you see that rodents are increasing or insects are bringing diseases to your field, then you don't want that. So you need to correct. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this is something that comes with experience. And, and at, at the, many times we make mistakes without really wanting to, but it happens. I mean, nature has its own, <laughs> its own uh, direction sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, yeah. in our farm, in our farm here in Colombia, we um, <clears throat> lose about 20% of our tomatoes to monkeys. And so I was thinking, what do I do? Do I combat the monkeys or do I share the, with the monkeys 20% of my, of, my, of my yield? And I decided to do that because, you know, combating the monkeys, who knows, you know, first of all, very expensive to do that. I don't wanna kill these animals. Uh, I'm the one that is offering them food. <laughs> So what I have learned is that you need to learn how to, uh, how to share with mm -hmm. these animals that are present in the ecosystem. Because if you're going to have complex matrix, you're not only going to attract beneficial insects and pollinators, you're going to attract all kinds of birds and other animals that sometimes they're going to encroach into the farm. So some farmers cannot afford to share 20% of their tomatoes with the monkeys. Okay, I do but others mm -hmm. don't. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the other issue. You know, the economics of this whole thing is something that, that takes uh, sometimes uh, mm -hmm. prevalence. But, you know, combating, you know, trying to control the rodents, trying to control the monkeys or whatever is going to have a cost, a huge cost. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, maybe losing 20% of the yield or sharing 20% of the yield with these creatures is cheaper than taking action against them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> so, very interesting uh, cases. Yeah, uh, yeah. We have a lot of farmers in Lamongan applying this uh, system. Yeah, complex system, uh, not only with fish but also with uh, border plants. And indeed, some of them have problem. And I also agree that this is a learning processes. And that's why we try to organize farmers to learn together participatorily and then in participative way. And then uh, they try to discuss how to cook this and if others has uh, uh, experience with this. So uh, uh, the design is uh, dynamic. So it, uh, it changes to, to, uh, to solve the problem by themselves. So it's, it's and uh, sometimes we come up with, with uh, uh, your solution by sharing. So we grew a cassava on border plants and indeed a rat really loves the cassava. Instead of eating rice, they eat cassava. So it's, it's some, some solution that maybe not many people happy, but 
Not so many uh, arise. So uh, very interesting. Uh, yeah. Other other questions? Okay. Thank you, Prof. Aldiari. So I agree all with uh, you mm -hmm. and Bu uh, Uma. Yeah. And uh, we also have uh, same opinion that we, we should uh, design the algorithm in a landscape scale that because for red and protein uh, measurement, we, we also sh should uh, manage protein in landscape, not, not in a plot or something. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, other more questions? Yeah. From student, maybe. From student? And what time uh, the course should be ended? You feel free? I think we, we have uh, two hours, it's okay. Uh, we have uh -huh. still a lot of time. For us, <laughs> yes, but for Prof. Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for me, I'm very happy to have uh, the opportunity to discuss with him. <laughs> and yeah, but for Prof. Miguel, maybe he has a very limited time. Maybe Bukarinda, you have any uh, other question? Okay. Yeah, Bukarinda has a lot of experience with refugia. He has, he has a lot of uh, experience with refugia and something in uh, habitat manipulation. Uh, you are still mute, Prof. Uh, Bukarinda. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my question, my question is, uh, how to how to select I mean, how to select uh, the the species of uh, white plant for the for the uh, refugia or for the border something like that. Uh, so, uh, if there are any, I mean, before before we decided to to uh, plant planting something like that. So, is there any uh, experiment? I mean, to, to to try to find what's the uh, what's the uh, what's the, the precise uh, precise uh, species that it's a uh, uh, fine for the for the pollinator for the uh, natural enemies yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I understand Kadena. thank you <clears throat> I think the first thing that we need to define decide, is why are we introducing these plants into the agroecosystem, either in the borders or inside the field? Is because they want to. We want them to play a function. Okay, so um, if we, for example, have very um, poor soils that are low in organic matter, with have bad structure, well, then we talk about uh, the introduction of green manures or plants around the field that are leguminous trees, like for example, Gliricidia, like that you can cut the branches and put them on, on top of the soil to enrich the soil. So that, 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 that would be one, one way of deciding. Now, you don't want to just grow hedgerows that are going to provide green manure. You want to have hedgerows that are multifunctional. In addition to producing green manure for your soil, uh, you want them to also have flowers so that they attract beneficial insects, pollinators, natural enemies, things of that nature. Because um, you see what happens with biological control is that <clears throat> there, is a, there is a concept called density dependence. Okay, that means that uh, if the pest population goes up, the natural enemy population also goes up or if the pest population goes up, the insects eat more, the, the predators eat more. But that density dependence response only happens 
at low densities of the pest. Okay. For example, if you if I don't know if you have experienced this, but if you have a lot of aphids in your field, no matter how many ladybugs you put there, they're not going to be able to catch up. So you want to have natural enemies present in your system so that when the pests arise, they can regulate them at the low densities. And this is why it's important to have an infrastructure of corridors, borders, or uh, strips within the system with flowers that are going to attract beneficial insects because they need pollen and nectar for their reproduction and longevity. So you need to have them present and then plant your crops. And when the, when, when the pest comes, there's already an army of natural enemies present that can respond to the increase of density of pests with, at, but, but, but the regulation happens at low densities, okay? This is a concept of, uh, there's two responses called the functional response and the numerical response associated with density dependence. So this is what we want to do is we want to, we want to equip the, 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 the natural enemies with the possibility of responding to the density increase of pests, but at low levels, at low densities of the pest. This is why sometimes I've seen that farmers want to plant flowers, for example, to attract beneficial insects, but they do it at the same time as they plant the crop. Well, you need the flowers being you know, flowering already by the time you plant your crops because you already have the presence of natural enemies. So sometimes when you plant the flowers at the same time with the crop, then the pests arise, but the natural enemies are not there yet because you don't have flowers to attract them. So this is also the timing is very, very important. The other thing that, that, that you need to do is to manage that vegetation because in the case of vineyards, for example, in the, the work that Clara did in California, the presence of cover crops that are flowering attracts beneficial insects, but the beneficial insects stay in the cover crop and they don't go up to the vine to control the pest because they have so much food in the cover crop. So you need to cut the cover crop in order to force the movement of the beneficial insects to the vines to control them. Otherwise they're gonna stay in the flowers. So the same thing could happen in-, in is that uh, it call it a uh, thing effect? A thing effect that the uh, natural enemies uh, won't go into to the field because they still uh, stay in the in the refugees. Yeah. So you need to manipulate the refugia. You need to do something. You need to force the movement. Okay. Maybe cut the, cut the, some flowers or. Some other farmers, what they do is they harvest, they go with a net into the refugia, they harvest the beneficial insects that are in the refugia in the, in the net, and then they release it in the center of the field. That's another possibility. But so the important thing is that you need to manage this vegetation. It's not something that you just plant and leave it there. You need to manage it and monitor it and so on. Okay. But uh, about the diversity of the species, uh, I think that if we plant uh, some uh, flowers plant, I think it will be a decrease the diversity. Uh, I mean, in in the ditch uh, for the uh, field uh, field area for the ditch, I think I I found that for one meter square, yeah, no, yeah, uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 meter square, uh, it will be grown, you know, that it would, it, uh, there, 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 there are, uh, around 20, 20 species of, uh, white, uh, plant. I mean, some, some of them is uh, wheat, you know, yeah, it's wheat. But I think if we uh, plant uh, some flowers in the deep, I think it will be decreased the diversity. I, I always think like that. Yeah. Because uh, if you, in your example, I think uh, 
because the the farmer have a more larger uh, field, so they can uh, they can plant a strip uh, a strip for uh, yeah, I mean they can provide uh, some uh, their uh, land for the strip uh, for the refugia. But I think uh, the farmer in Indonesia they they only have a small uh, a small uh, field. So I think they won't they won't uh, uh, they won't let uh, some some uh, their field even only uh, maybe and only maybe one meter square for for plant for planting the refugia. So I think uh, in the depths it will be okay. It will be okay. So, uh, but uh, if we plant uh, some like uh, like sunflower or uh, astra, some astra like that, I think it. I I always think that it will be decreased the diversity. What do you think, Rob? Okay, um, I understand that if small farmers have very limited amount of land, uh, they want to probably devote all the land for food production and not, you know, have uh, land devoted to other uses like refugia and things like that. they can work out something in the borders of the fields or something like that in order to increase the, uh, the, uh, the environmental opportunities for natural enemies. Or you don't have to have refugia if you intercrop, for example. If you increase the diversity within the farm, which is something that the farmers might want to do, you also create refugia by doing that, by increasing diversity through intercropping our systems. So I think that um, that, that, that's my take on the thing. I, I didn't understand your question about uh, that, the reduction of biodiversity. I didn't understand that. If you could repeat, please. Uh, as I said before that, uh, I, I have found uh, in the uh, 0.5 square uh, meters from the dates, in the dates, yeah, it, uh, there are, uh, at least 20 species of wheat. Okay. So if okay. and that and okay. that and that uh, and that side, it will be planted. It will be planted. Uh, some uh, flowers plant. I think some of the wheat will be gone. I see. Yeah. I see. So I yeah. think. It, it, I mean that it will decrease the diversity. It's possible. Yeah, or replace it for another one. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree with you. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's better that uh, still uh, man maintain the, all of the white plant uh, surround the field, surround the field, and then just we can uh, uh, select, I mean, select uh, which one that uh, it will be uh, benefit for the pollinator or for the uh, major enemies. Because I have, uh, I have an experience that, that uh, for example, that there's a grillid, grillid, uh, the metilcha is a predator for uh, uh, some eggs of Lepidoptera and then small for the small, small insects. Uh, but uh, they, uh, the, the metilcha have to oviposit and uh, not in the rice, you know. They don't like uh, oviposit uh, on the rice. But they are uh, uh, like opposite on the just like uh, the cyprasin, cyprasin, and then 
like that. So, but the Ciparase, uh, some of Ciparase is a, uh, uh, is a wheat, you know, yeah. So, so wheat, yeah. Yeah, that's it. And it's a uh, important wheat for the rice. Yeah. So, uh, if the wheat still in the ditch, that they, they, they grow in the ditch, I think it's, it's okay. So we can uh, provide the oviposition site for the grill it. Just like that. Yeah, very interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I think we have limited time. Yeah, thank you for the discussion. <laughs> and that, that's, that's very interesting. And maybe before we close, uh, uh, the course and the head of department will uh, want to say something. Uma, there is yeah? one question from Sweden. Oh, oh okay. Ah, yeah. Can we have one more, Prof. Alteri? Yeah, yeah. Well, I see. I see the question that says that uh, can we produce high production even that that is in an agroforestry if we compare with monoculture of coffee or cacao. Can we implement organic agriculture in that agroforestry? And what is the best refugia in that agroforestry? Well, actually, um, when we talk about yields of coffee or cocoa compared to monocultures, usually the yield is a little bit lower, maybe 15% lower, but that's only coffee or cacao when you're comparing cacao and cacao. But in Colombia, for example, in Latin America, the farmers don't only grow coffee, they grow banana, they grow um, avocados, they grow citrus, they grow many other crops. So you cannot compare just the production of cacao versus cacao in agroforestry versus monoculture. You have to take into consideration the total production of the agroforestry system, which is much higher than the monoculture when you take into consideration the yield of the avocado, the citrus, the the papayas and, and all these other crops that they grow together with the, with, the, with the system. And you also can do a comparison of yield, not only the biomass, the weight, how much per kilos per hectare, but you can look at the yield in terms of, for example, energy use, in terms of uh, uh, production per unit of energy, production per unit of water lost, and so on and so on. And when you look at those efficiencies, then the, 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 the agroforestry systems are much more effective. Now, if you do, if you follow the agroecological principles, you can, and you can have an agroforestry system, you can certify it organic if you want, obviously, because, uh, because when you follow the agroecological principles, for sure, you're gonna follow the, you're going to meet all the requirements that that organic farming uh, certification provides. As a matter of fact, many farmers uh, that grow in agroforestry are organic, are certified organic because they don't use inputs. And what is the best refugia? Well, the refugia is the, is the system itself. You don't need to create refugia in an agroforestry system because there's so much diversity and complexity in the agroforestry system that that's enough to provide habitat and to provide alternative food and everything for the beneficial insects and pollinators and, and many animals. As a matter of fact, they have studied compared by diversity of birds and, and mammals and, and insects between agroforestry and monocultures of coffee and the difference is so huge, it's huge. It's actually the agroforestry by diversity of animals is much closer to the natural forest than the, than the agricultural system. So that's my answer, Uma. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, please, Pak Lukman. <laughs> A final word. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> final remark. Yeah. Thank you, Uma. Professor Altieri, uh, in behalf of uh, Phoenix Asperia, yeah, in the Faculty of Agriculture, so we would like to thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your time and uh, great uh, lecture. And also to Prof. Nikos that uh, give uh, valuable knowledge and experience to us. And 
we in faculty uh, agriculture we also has uh, any uh, we have uh, commit that we should uh, uh, what do you call it uh, to reach uh, uh, sustainable agriculture then and this uh, this what this lecture uh, uh, of agriculture one of uh, backbone of uh, uh, lecture that we, we we provide to our students. So in the first seven, we have uh, agroecology and then this uh, management of agriculture and then sustainable uh, agriculture also. So we have three. three. So uh, we hope, yeah, we, we should continue this this uh, collaboration. Maybe in the near future, maybe with uh, Uma also, we should uh, uh, some uh, collaboration, uh, maybe for not, not only uh, a lecture or maybe another uh, yeah, for example, activity, uh, yeah. research or something like yeah. activity yeah because Uma is also the of uh, international <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> international office yeah, in, in our faculty uh, and I hope uh, uh, so thank so at, at this time, I would like to uh, thank uh, very much to Prof. Aldieri and so Prof. Yosef, my best to Prof. Nicole also. Uh, so to audience, uh, to students and uh, our colleagues uh, uh, from University of Prairijaya and also the other, thank you very much for also for your time to join this, uh, this uh, uh, very outstanding lecture from Prof. Aldieri and Prof. Nicole. I think that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fatman. You want to have something to say, Prof. Uh, Alkeri? Well, I wanted to thank you very much again for the uh, opportunity to share with you our, our, our experiences. And hopefully, we will continue the collaboration, hopefully in person maybe some courses that we can do in Indonesia or mm -hmm. some research mm -hmm. or so please uh, count on us if you need some further collaboration in the future. Okay, so thank you very much for all audience, especially to uh, Prof. Miguel Alfieri and also to Dr. Nichols. And yeah, we do hope to uh, further uh, our collaboration in more fruitful uh, uh, activities and yeah we will keep in touch and see some more uh, opportunities thank you thank you thank you yeah bye sampun yeah bu terima kasih bu ma